produced um, some 36 books and several TV series. Uh, the latest one, which is currently showing, is Big Cat Tales on Animal Planet. In addition to that, they have formed the Sacred Nature Initiative. Uh, due to their concern about the planet and the loss of wildlife. And so they're going to be telling us more about that in due course. Uh, I remember last week... Loss of wildlife. And so they're going to be telling us more about that in due course. Uh, uh, I remember last week... Loss of wildlife. And so they're going to be telling us more about that in due course. Um, I remember last week's wildlife, and so they're going to be telling us more about that in due course. Um, I remember last week's wildlife, and so they're going to be telling us more about that in due course. Um, I remember last week's wildlife, and so they're going to be telling us more about that in due course. Um, Good talk. Good talk. I remember last week's wildlife, and so they're going to be telling us more about that in due course. Why, Maggie? Why? Good talk. It's repeating. Why? It's repeating itself. Uh, eu, eu não estou te entendendo, Mark. Que fala? Okay. Okay. Well, I'm, uh, I'd just like to say then that uh, as a zoologist, Jonathan is the best person in the world to take us through the world of beast migration. And Angie, with her very sensitive eye, is the best person to show it to us. Over to you, Angie and Jonathan, for your presentation. And uh, we're just wondering, uh, we're just hoping, Guto, that uh, the sound issues, because we can hear a lot of background noise uh, with um, what was Maggie talking, repeating itself. But that now seems to have faded away. So welcome to everybody from the Big Cat people, Jonathan Angela Scott, here at home in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, we're delighted to be part of the Avastar celebrations. Uh, we're keen birders ourselves. But in this instance, we want to take the theme of migration, which I think you mentioned the word people think of birds, those extraordinary journeys of swifts and swallows from Europe all the way through to Africa. Uh, we want to take that theme and we want to share with you the great migration of wildebeest and zebra uh, here at home in Kenya. Now, in 19, uh, I've got to try and get my head around the dates here because it seems so long ago now, but in 1996, the BBC and Animal Planet started an extremely successful TV series called Big Cat Diary. Angie was the stills photographer for that series, and I was one of the presenters. And it basically allowed us to share the kind of story, the kind of life that we have lived in the Masai Mara National Reserve in southwest Kenya uh, ever since I first came to watch a particular group of lions when I came to live in the Mara in 1977, those very same lions that you can see here. The TV show was called Big Cat Diary, and Angie was not only our stills photographer for the series, she was also one of our star animal spotters. Now, I can't help but find myself chuckling here because uh, even though I'm doing most of the talking, most of these pictures are Angie's, and I think you can see oh here God. that even though Angie was uh, you know, tasked with finding our big cats, when it came to finding this particular cheetah, it really wasn't very difficult. You can see she's using a wide angle lens. This cheetah's name was Kike. She became famous for all the wrong reasons when she peed and pooped through my roof hatch, which entertained millions of people. And I always say it's why I've still got such a thick head of hair. So the Masai Mara, for us, it is a kingdom of predators. It is the most extraordinary visible landscape. The landscape, the savannas are so open. You can see big cats from miles away often. And I don't want to undersell Angie's contribution in finding us the big cats, but in this particular instance, she was spending time with these gorgeous male lions, uh, three of Notch's boys, famous lions, which were part of the Marsh Pride. And so lions, as Margie said, or certainly was trying to say uh, with the sound system that we often say to people, we know some of these lions better than our friends. And we certainly see them more often than our friends, 
Although for the last year or so, we've been locked down due to the COVID pandemic, and we can't wait to leave home here in Nairobi and head for the Maasai Mara. Well, we call ourselves the big cat people. And I think you can see from this photograph, that's not a boastful uh, way of describing ourselves. We've been obsessed with these big cats. And this was taken recently after Big Cat Diary, which ran BBC Animal Planet, ran from 1996 to 2008, 12 years on mainstream television. About three or four years ago, we were approached to film a new series for Animal Planet called Big Cat Tales. Angie was one of the presenters, along with our great friend Jackson Oli Lusea, a Maasai safari guide and naturalist. And Angie spent a lot of time with these same lions we've been watching all these years, the Marsh Pride. Now, normally, if you get big cats moving towards a vehicle, we tend to move away. We don't want to influence their behavior. But before Angie could move the car, she was doing some filming. She was being recorded, her presentation. And before she could get into the driver's seat and drive off the whole pride of lions, Ascari and uh, Mpoli, the two pride males, BB. Cloudy Eye, Dada, Carly, all the cubs had Just come to lie up in the shade. One, one little sec, Jonathan. Uh, yes, okay. No could, you please, could you please click on the presentation? It's not, it's not showing. Oh. Okay, to us, the presentation is up. Can you see the, uh, the, the dawn rising, the sunrise? So you're not seeing any of the images? Do you want us to just go out of the presentation a minute? It says steamyard.com uh, is yes, sharing your yes. screen. It says steamyard. Uh, it says steamyard. Uh, dot com is yeah, sharing yeah. the screen. It says steamyard. Uh, it says steamyard. Uh, okay, so we're just on standby here. We uh, oh, on us. Jonathan. Uh, yes, hi. Please. Thank you. Restart, restart your presentation, please, uh, okay, and, no and your share. Okay, let's go. Uh, so should we go out completely? Yes. No, no, so, uh, just stop share. Stop share. Okay, stop share, right. Okay, yeah. Okay. So now uh, open your presentation and share it again. Okay, and we just start from the beginning, yeah? Yeah. Okay, you just give us the yeah, thumbs up please. that uh, you've got everything. And I'm just going to, okay, so now, can you see now our screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Guto, you're, we're, we're good to go. We start from the top, right? Okay, great. Please. Okay, Sorry no worries. Okay, so not at all. This is, uh, as they say, this is live television, and uh, you never know what's going to happen. I remember when yeah. we were doing Africa Watch uh, live television from the Masai Mara in 1989, and we thought everything was going fine until we got word back and we saw signs of distress on our producer's face, and he said the pictures are breaking up and they're all in black and white. So anyway, we now are assured you can see us. And uh, this is the Big Cat people, Jonathan and Angela Scott, talking to you from our home here in Nairobi, Kenya. We are so thrilled to be part of this Avastar Brazil event. And in 1996, to give you a little bit of background, we've spent the last 40 years in 1977 watching this Pride of Lions, the Marsh Pride. And uh, in 1996, the BBC and Animal Planet decided to make a series called Big Cat Diary, which in an essence focused on what we had been doing for our life, going out every day and watching individual big cats. And as we say to people, we know some of these cats because we know them as individuals. We can recognize the individual lions initially by their whisker spot pattern, 
Every lion has a different thumbprint on their muzzle, those little spot markings. And of course, over time, you get to know them regardless of their spot marking. Some have a torn ear, some have half a tail, some have big wounds that make them recognizable. But certainly, we know some of them better than our friends, and we see some of them more often than our friends. During this last year, we've been locked down here at home in Nairobi, but we can't wait to get back to our second home here in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. So sit back. This will be the cheapest safari you've ever had, and certainly it will be COVID-free. So enjoy. Well, I always laugh to myself when I see this picture because Angie's role with Big Cat Diary is as our production stills photographer. So she actually gets captures images of the big cats for us so as we can use them for publicity plus she is one of our star big cat spotters because she knows these individual cats so well knows their habits know where know where they roam and unlike a migratory animal these big cats tend to live in a fixed location so they're not nomadic, although cheetahs have some element of their behavior like that. But certainly lions and leopards are territorial. And when the wildebeest move through, that's just a feast. And then they don't follow them. They stay in their territories. But this particular cheetah, Kike, used to love to jump up on the roof of cars to get a better sight, a better view across the landscape, to keep those cubs protected and to be able to find food in the same way she would do with a termite mound. Now, the downside for me was that when she jumped on my car and sat on one half of the open roof hatch, she then decided to do what she would do on a termite mound, and she peed and she pooped through the hatch. I tell you, six million people in the UK voted it one of their top three moments of the year. And even today, when I go, go to England, sometimes I'm stopped and somebody says, aren't you that guy? And they've normally got a smile on their face. And I just know they're going to say they got crapped on by a cheetah. So the Mara, a kingdom of predators, one of the most visible landscapes, one of the most, the reason we've been there all these years still as photographers, because it is a photographer's paradise. Angie took this glorious picture of three of five of a group of lions called Notches Boys, who with their older relative dominated this area, Paradise Plains. And Angie was able to do, add that little bit of magic and conjure up an image which speaks to you of the power and the wonder of these savanna landscapes. Well, when we talk about ourselves as the big cat people, it's not being boastful. We, as I say, have spent years watching the same individuals, tracking their stories, photographing them, writing about them, filming them, drawing them. And normally we would move away if a group of lions tried to come over and lie in the shade of the car, Angie's Land Rover in this instance, but we just couldn't do it even fast enough because Angie was actually doing a piece to camera the cameraman was taking a picture as the lions moved towards the vehicle, speaking to Angie. And before you knew it, Ascari, the dark maned lion in the foreground, his buddy on poly, cloudy eyed Bibi, um, Kabibi, and Dada, and all the cubs came and lay in the shade. And so, a wonderful moment for an image, but something, as I say, we want to respect the animals. We don't want to crowd them. But do they look bothered? They certainly don't. Now, life for us is basically determined by light. As photographers, it's all about seeing the light. So every morning we are out of our stone cottage at Governor's Camp in Marsh Pride Territory, heading out into Musiara Marsh. Angie will be saying, did you hear where those lions were roaring last night? It came from this direction. Let's start there. And you go out after it's rained in the evening, the night before, and you might get this glorious beautiful mist with the topi and the impala and then that extra element that as photographers you're always hoping for a flock of sacred ibis just flying over the rising sun so perfect the perfect beginning to a day for us out in the Maasai Mara now we want to talk to you about the great migration of wildebeest and zebra but how lucky are we in Kenya in East Africa to have that other extraordinary population, millions of lesser flamingos who migrate between soda lakes dotted along the Great Rift Valley in East Africa. And they move, their movements are determined by their food supply. 
So they feed on this blue-green algae in these soda lakes, and they also nest at certain of those soda lakes. We've spent time down in Lake Natron in Tanzania, where you get these extraordinary congregations of these flamingos when they, they come there to nest. And this was described by the great ornithologist who some of you may have heard of, certainly if you're tuning in from America, Roger Tory Peterson immortalized this particular spectacle by calling it the greatest bird spectacle on earth. And it's right here in East Africa. And if you come to see the great migration of wildebeest, be sure to go to those soda lakes and see the flamingos as well. It is quite, quite extraordinary. But look, at the flick of a switch, from flamingos to the great migration of wildebeest. Now we call it the great migration because it is the largest single land mammal migration on earth. 1.2 million wildebeest nomadic, roaming around an area of 25,000 square kilometers, the ecosystem defined by the wandering of the migration of these wildebeest. And along with them, 200,000 zebras, 400, 500,000 gazelles, all moving through this area. And I just love this thought too. In the 1960s, a, a couple who were to become very, very well known, Dr. Bernard Jimmock and his son Michael, flew to Africa. They learned to fly. He was a vet, a veterinarian, a zoologist. Michael, a young, you know, go out there adventurer with his dad. And they wanted to know more about the extent of the great migration of the wildebeest and zebra because the park authorities, the colonial authorities, the British at that point, were going to change the boundaries of the Serengeti and the adjacent area in the Ngorongora crater because the Maasai people who had moved in that area for the last 200 years were asking for access to water holes and to salt lakes to be able to bring their cattle into the protected area. So there was talk about changing the boundary. And the Jimmocks, this extraordinary name, Bernard and Michael Jimmock, they said, before we make these kind of changes haphazardly, let's think scientifically and how important in today's world is trying to get the truth through science. And they said, what we've got to do is we have to learn to fly. And like these Rupel's griffin vultures, if we can fly, we can actually follow and we can document the extent of the migration. And then we can advise the park authorities on how big the area should be to be able to safeguard the migration. Now, tragically, and what an irony, Bernard and Michael Jimmick, this was 1959, Oscar winning movie called Serengeti Shall Not Die, documenting their time there. A book, Serengeti Not Shall Not Die, but during the last phase of making of that book and that movie, Michael Jimmick, this young, adventurous, just full of life individual, took off in his Dornier airplane and he collided with one of these vultures. And it bent the ailerons, the control cables, along the front edge of the wing. And he plummeted to his death. And there is a, a memorial to Michael Jimmick who gave his life to conservation along the edge of the Ngorongora crater. Now the reason, because I know there's a lot of birders listening to this, also to talk to you about these birds is, they migrate, they follow the migration from their roosting sites where they nest in the Gol Mountains at the edge of the Serengeti National Park. They fly and track the migration and they feed on carcasses and they fly back, one bird staying at the nest. So they monitor the movements of the migration. And that's where the Jimmicks, you know, then had this brainwave of we've got to fly. We have to see the migration from above. Sadly, in recent times, these birds have been decimated by pesticides. Pesticides to kill insects, to promote crop growth, but pesticides also used by pastoralists, by herdsmen, to lace carcasses killed by predators to eradicate them. So conflict between cattle people and these predators. And the population of Rupel's griffin vultures 
has absolutely plummeted. To give you an idea of the effect of these vultures, they estimated 35,000 vultures in the 25,000 square kilometers, 35,000 vultures consuming 12 million kilograms of meat a year. What an extraordinary bird. So a little bit more, don't worry, we'll get onto the migration, that other migration in a minute. But again, 53 birds of prey in the Masai Mara, over 500 species of birds. On the left, an immature fish eagle, the cry of Africa. I'll just give you a little sort of This beautiful resonant call, much nicer than that. A young bird takes four or five years to mature, to have that beautiful white head, looks a bit like a bald eagle. And here, contesting a catfish, which it was being feeding on in the marsh with a marabou stalk. So one of our 53 birds of prey and all of the birds of prey, or many of them are threatened by furidin, by these pesticides, which are put out there to protect crops and which have huge impact on the ecosystem. I just love this picture. So the migration, 1.2 million wildebeest, 200,000 zebras, hundreds of thousands of gazelles moving around this vast ecosystem. An individual journey for a wildebeest, maybe 3,000 kilometers or so in a year. And even though there is a direction to their movement which follows the pattern of rainfall, and the area of least rainfall is the, the southern plains of the Serengeti, and the highest rainfall is the Masai Mara to the north. They move between that area. But it is haphazard to the eye, but actually it's always determined by finding where the grass is greenest. How do you, how do you capture the, the scale of this? Well, Angie, with this black and white picture, can tell a story for you in a single picture. What drives the migration? rainfall. What does rainfall produce? Fresh grass shoots. What are wildebeest absolutely perfectly adapted to sense rainfall before it's even fallen? Ionized moisture in the air, tracking the pattern of where the rain is going to fall. And they are so efficient in their movements, they can run as efficiently as if they walked, but get there a lot quicker. So the movement of these animals is determined by the pattern of the rainfall. And every year, every year's migration is different. And just to give you an idea of the impact and the adaptations of this particular extraordinary animal, people sometimes talk of it a little bit disparagingly as, as sort of, you know, the clown of the plains. Some people say it was put together by God, by the remains of all of the other animals, all the spare parts, the tail of a horse, the head of an ox, the body of an antelope. But I tell you what, the wildebeest is perfectly adapted for the life on the move, to be constantly moving. And when they have their calves on the southern plains of the Serengeti during the rainy season, those tiny calves are on their feet, can you believe it? Between five and 10 minutes, they're wobbling after their mum. Their migration year has begun. And the mothers choose to have their calves on the short grass plains of the, of the Serengeti, the most open, no bushes, just grasslands and rocky outcrops. And that is the safest place for them to give birth because they can see where the predators are. And of course, most of the predators, the cats, are stalking predators. They need cover. Out on the open plains, in the, on the short grass plains, very difficult for the big cats to stalk up on these. And so the wildebeest migration begins with these little calves, and they are born at a peak between January and March. Half a million wildebeest calves are born within a six weeks period. And the reason that the wildebeest go back south to the Serengeti Plains, not to the Mara, they turn and they head south 200 kilometers to the southern Serengeti Plains, the southernmost part of the ecosystem. Why? Because the soils of those plains are derived from the ashes of the Ngorongora Crater Highlands and they are alkaline soils. 
And those soils are rich in calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, all the things, all the nutritious elements that a cow wildebeest needs to create plenty of nutritious milk and for nice strong bones for the calves. And those short grass plains are short grass and no trees because the calcium seeps down through the soil and anything between a few centimeters to a meter below the soil, they create a hard pan, rock hard calcium carbonate. And the trees with roots, deep rooted, they can't penetrate. So that's why these open plains are open. And that's why the grasses are so rich in minerals. And the migration is driven by rainfall. And the movement is determined to a degree by actually moving along this mineral gradient, moving back towards the most mineral rich grasses at the time of the carving of the wildebeest. So I say, not great for the big cats. Those wildebeest and the little calves which are up and running, which can outdistance a lion or a leopard and a cheetah at times, those calves are at their safest from big cats on the open plains. But there are two predators that actually are perfectly adapted to a different strategy. They're coursers. They run and run and they chase their prey to exhaustion. Even though it appears here as if they're trying to get as close as possible to the wildebeest, these African wild dogs, these wolves of the plain, the painted wolves, Lycaon pictus, they're trying to get close, but believe me, they are marathon runners. They can run for kilometer after kilometer, chasing the wildebeest to exhaustion or the gazelles and then disemboweling them. So they don't have a single killing bite like a single solitary predator like most cats who have to overpower their prey, put it down, kill it quickly. With the dogs and the other predator adapted for this kind of coursing strategy, the spotted hyenas. They simply compete by bolting their food and eating as fast as possible. So the migration from the southern plains of the Serengeti, so between the southern plains of the Serengeti and the Masai Mara, an area as the crow flies, 200 kilometers. The movement of the wildebeest, so the wildebeest are congregated on the short grass plains in the rainy season, November through to May. But in May, and if you're out there, as I was, living in my car, tracking the migration, following the wild dogs, you can feel the easterly winds picking up, sucking the water from the plains. There's no permanent water on these southern plains. They get half the rainfall that the northern plains and the Mara get, and they get it all between November and May. Come May, the wildebeest en masse turn, and they head towards the woodlands in the center of the park, up around Serenera, and west into an area which leads towards Lake Victoria called the Western Corridor. Now again, thinking about the migration and how perfectly these animals are adapted to the rigors of everything on the move. At this time, as the wildebeest move into these woodlands, so we're now in May, June, the herds are at their most concentrated, so this is the perfect time for the rut, the breeding of the wildebeest to begin. And the male wildebeest perform this ritualized form of jousting, of fighting. They go down on their knees and they push head to head to establish a trial of strength. And each of these adult bulls, if they're fit enough, they locate, they mark out by dung and by their voice. They have this they have this voice which advertise their presence. Their territory is literally them and the piece of turf where they're standing. And as the wildebeest females move through in these massed herds, they are at their most concentrated. So with the bulls and the females are only in season in estrus for a single 24 hour period. And the males herd the females onto their territory. And as the females move on, the next male tries to mate with them. And as the whole herd moves through, the wildebeest bulls decamp, they leave their territory, they rush forward and set up another one. So this rutting of the wildebeest 
it actually is thought the sound that sound of those bulls like red deer during the rutting they believe the scientists that it possibly helps to stimulate the females to come into season so all the females come into season during the rutting time within a few weeks and then all of the females give birth come january february march the following year so you get this synchrony which is the most efficient way for these animals to live Angie, always on the lookout for a picture. So if I'm saying, okay, here's the wildebeest, let's grab another shot of the mast herd. And Angie say, no, let's capture the picture of these cattle egrets as they ride along on the back of the wildebeest, perched on the back of the wildebeest. And as the wildebeest stir up locusts, grasshoppers, crickets, frogs, the egrets would hop down onto the ground and feed, just like lilac-breasted rollers, wattle uh, uh, wattled starlings another bird wattle starlings uh, the um, lilac breasted rollers using these animals as perches to mobile perches so as they can monitor where the animals are going and as all those millions of hooves move through the pasture stirs up food for them and of course the key to great photography side light or backlight, a nice clean background, a beautiful picture captured by Angie. So the fascination also of this migration, so 25,000 square kilometers, the area, the ecosystem. Now the Masai Mara National Reserve in Kenya, to the south of it, the Serengeti National Park where Angie grew up in Tanzania, covers only half of that 25,000 square kilometer area. So half the area, is outside the protected area. Well, it's still protected, but it's private land. And as these animals move around on migration, there is what we call a feeding succession. So you've got the wildebeest, 1.2 million. You've got the zebras, 200,000. And you've got the Thompson's gazelle, four, 500,000. And as they move off the short grass plains where the grass is short and the rain stop come May, and they move into the long grass areas, there's a feeding succession. The zebras, they're not ruminants, they're equids, they're horses, they like hay. So they go into the long grass, chop down the long grass stems and seed heads of the red oak grass, and then in behind them come the wildebeest. So you often see the zebras ahead, then the wildebeest taking the shorter grass, and then behind them, the Thompson's gazelles, taking the herb layer and the shortest grass of all. So you've got these different species managing to avoid competition by taking different parts of the vegetation. Here's a Thompson's gazelle. So hundreds of thousands of them, that dainty little mouth, they will put their face down into the long grass and nibble along the short green shoots. And so this movement, this migration, this incredible journey, one of the interesting things about it is that up until the 1950s, so before Bernard and Michael Jimmick came to count the wildebeest and find out how far the animals migrated, there was only 100 to 200,000 wildebeest migrating between the short grass plains and the western central part of Serengeti. They didn't come as far as north as the Masai Mara. They didn't need to. 200,000 of them. And the reason their population was at that level, not 1.2 million, was because of the periodic outbreaks of a viral disease called cattle plague or rinderpest, which devastated the wildebeest from time to time. Now, the cattle people, the Maasai, living in and around this area, they always tended to believe that it was the wildlife that was bringing rinderpest to the cattle. But guess what? When the veterinary services in the late 50s through to the early 60s inoculated the livestock around the Mara Serengeti, hey presto, the disease died out. And now rinderpest is a thing of the past. It very, very rarely, it, it basically has been announced as a non-event, a little bit like smallpox. So this extraordinary disease which affect didn't affect zebras, but it affect cloven hoofed animals. And so the wildebeest, now when that was eradicated, 
Just after the Jinnoks wrote Serengeti Shall Not Die, 200,000 wildebeest in 10 years became 700,000. Nature abhors a vacuum. By five years later, 1975, we were at 1.2 million animals. And what the migration basically did was, of course, as areas opened up to it, there was areas to the north. Now, when they changed the park boundaries, there was an area between the Serengeti and the Mara, which we call the Northern Extension. It's a corridor of land linking the central part of Serengeti through as a protected area to the Maasai Mara. And the wildebeest, when there were 200,000, didn't have to go that far. But as the population recovered from Rinderpest, the animals began to explore as the population, they had to. So they began to move to north, exploring for new areas where they could, and they found them in these dry season holding areas, in areas where there is double the rainfall, the Maasai Mara, than there is in the southern Serengeti. And that is why the Mara, which is only one eighth the size of the Serengeti, is vital to the wildebeest population because it's where they can find permanent water, the Mara River. In the Southern Plains, there is no permanent water. In the Western Corridor, there's some ephemeral, some water. But in the Mara, there is the Mara River. And so this movement now into the Mara has been propagated by the fact that this control of Rinderpest allowed the migration to expand, as we say, nature hates a vacuum expand into the Mara. If you look at guidebooks up until the 1960s, they don't even mention wildebeest as occurring in the Mara. But by the time I arrived there, 1977, they certainly were moving into the Mara. Now, there is also another migration in Kenya. So we get the migration from the Serengeti, 1.2 million wildebeest. But to the east of the Maasai Mara in Kenya, is an area called the Loiter Plains. And that used to have a separate migratory population of wildebeest of 120,000 animals. And in the wet season, they would be on the Loiter Plains. In the dry season, they would join with these Serengeti wildebeest and move into the Mara. Well, pressure by man, wheat schemes, land changes, there are now less than 20,000 wildebeest where there was previously 120,000. And even though the great migration at 1.2 million is still this extraordinary spectacle, the scientists have documented that in recent years, the Mara used to get half, 600,000 of the 1.2 million wildebeest moving around within the reserve in the dry season. In recent years, due to land changes, pressure, from pastoralism, it's now 150,000, from 600,000 to 150,000 animals on migration in that particular area. And as I say, the loiter population greatly diminished. So as wonderful a spectacle as this, the warning signs are there. And in fact, all five wildebeest migrations in Africa are under threat due to land changes, due to pressure from changes in land use in and around these areas. So it's a warning to us. Now, the Mara River is one of the barriers to the wildebeest. So every year they come to the river and you could say, well, why are they crossing like the chicken? Why is it crossing the road? The wildebeest are crossing the Mara River to get to the other side because it will be an area where they have yet been grazing. So they move down to the river, they choose areas which they have, there will be some of these animals are 12, maybe even 15 years old. So even though there's not a specific leader in the amongst the herds and the migration, the older animals are more confident about coming to particular places along the river where there's greater visibility, where there's less bushes and where they perhaps have crossed before. So there's experience within it. And you hear people saying, so let's say in a, when the river's high and there's big crossings, you could lose literally hundreds of animals, trampled, drowned, killed by crocodiles, ambushed by lions and leopards. But the death of these animals is part of a natural cycle. And so thoughts of building bridges or ramps to make it easier 
for the animals actually is going against nature because what actually moves these animals in terms of adapting them so as they are so perfectly as they have been there's been wildebeest migrating around the serengeti for a million years they're the right animal for the right environment and so generally if we can keep our hands off and look and just celebrate this extraordinary event as opposed to try and change it now i just love this picture this is a picture that angie took while i was bleating in her ear about no angie you know get lower this is a great shot from down here and angie just said johnny you know i know there's no off switch but please just for the moment keep quiet 100 to 400 millimeter canon zoom lens and this extraordinary mass movement of these wildebeest that the, i mean it, as Henri Cartier-Bresson, the great uh, French master photographer, described it, the decisive moment, that moment when geometry, atmosphere, light, and I promise you, for photographers, dust or splashing water, you can't get better. And Angie conceived, she could see this photograph before it happened. And that's being a photographer, seeing it in your mind's eye, not just reacting to what you see, but preempting it being in the right position, and those other animals just drifting off in the background. I just love it. And that picture reminds me of the fact of that other great migration across the North American prairies. They estimate 20 to 50 million bison and a culture tied to it, like the Maasai with their cattle, the first American people, the Plains Indian, and their culture centered around the bison, this great beast that literally spread from one side of the continent to the other. And those 20 to 50 million, compared with 1.2 million, which is now our largest, within 100 years they've gone. Partly political, partly greed. It's just extraordinary and a lesson. But are we listening? I'm not sure. So the difference that the migration makes to the big cats, well, You've got a migratory animal, which in some ways, by migrating, by never being anywhere for too long, escapes the full impact of predation. If you're a thousand wildebeest in a herd, and there's a pride of lions because they're territorial in one particular place, let's say the marsh pride, 25 lions back then, and they are the territory holders, and you're a thousand wildebeest moving through, one of you, maybe three, might not make it, but the bulk of you will. So that being part of the herd, again, from that migratory process, the success of these animals by immersing themselves, they will look the same, to me at least, as they move together. And the lions, yes, they target them, and yes, they benefit from the migration. So June through till October in the Masai Mara, the time of the migration, moving into that area, Great time for breeding for lions, great time for cub survival, plenty of food, good time for mating, good time for lactation, which is driven by the availability of food. But when the wildebeest move, when the food train leaves town, the lions must stay where they are. Their numbers are dictated by the resident prey species. That's what controls their population. The migration is just a very welcome feast. Communication. Well, we talked about how voice in terms of that mm, mm, that grunting of the bull wildebeest, perhaps promoting estrus in females. Well, sound is vitally important for lions in terms of communicating. The roaring of a lion can be heard for up to five, eight kilometers. And it's a great way of avoiding conflict because you can bellow at the top of your voice and another lion will know who you are. Are you a friend? Are you a foe? Should we approach? Should we leave? So roaring and scent marking is how these animals mark out their territory. These male coalitions helping to actually, you know, that's really what makes lions so unique amongst the cats. The one amongst 38 species which isn't solitary. Leopards, they too, crafty, beautiful, elusive, and taking advantage of the migration when it's through, killing calves, even killing adults. And the master hunter of the flat-out sprint, one of Honey's boys, three male cheetahs, brothers, hunting wildebeest. When the wildebeest come through, they target the calves. 
and then when honey's boys those three male cheetahs were basically legend in the mara for years in the early 200s 2000s and then we had this five male cheetahs a coalition of five brothers stay together sometimes non relatives join together because it helps them to defend a territory five cheetahs together born from three different mothers hunting wildebeest ah. it's not just calves when you've got this kind of backup they can take adult wildebeest and the killing bite as i say not like wild dogs chasing their prey to exhaustion and competing with each other literally by feeding as fast as they can and bolting their food with cheetahs that killing bite the cats use and so the maasai the reason that the mara serengeti survives today is because of the maasai people the great areas in east africa many of them the wildlife areas are coincident with maasai land because the maasai saw cattle as a gift from god they didn't and don't kill wildlife for food they rely on their livestock for that and their relationship to the landscape was like the wildebeest they moved to follow the pattern of the rainfall they moved to find the best areas of grazing they never stayed too long they moved and moved and moved and i can see angie's just telling me to move on here a little bit so i know we've still got time but the story is just coming to an end now so the difference of course when you look at the mara serengeti this extraordinary ecosystem 25000 square kilometers just a quick inventory 3000 lions maybe 1000 leopards who knows how many 800 is a guess 250 cheetahs a bit more accurate 5000 hyenas 1.2 million wildebeest 200000 zebras hundreds of thousands of gazelles and the system is still ticking over perfectly because we are in general not interfering with it nature is actually running the show but now unfortunately there are transitions which are coming into these areas we call these the savannas of our birth let's face it this is east africa is most likely the birthplace of man and our relationship the maasai's relationship to the landscape of course now is changing what was formerly communal land in the land of the maasai in the mara serengeti and the surrounding areas those areas outside the park are being subdivided into 50 to 150 acre plots that cannot sustain large scale cattle herding so times must change and we must help to actually ensure these transitions so as there is still a way for man and wildlife to exist together now in 2016 we wrote a book called sacred nature life eternal dance and it was angie's brainwave or her sort of it was her dream to create a book which could do justice to our images but also which celebrated the mara serengeti what the place that we consider the last great place on earth there is nowhere to rival it and we began to see at that time that at this point in our career the purpose of our photography has to be driven by helping conservation imperatives so we created something which we call the sacred nature initiative and that is based on three pillars to inspire which we hope we will have done with our images today to educate to help everybody understand how important nature is because what we don't know about we certainly won't conserve and with more than 50% of people now living in urban environments many people have become disconnected from nature so this year we're publishing a book sacred nature volume 2 reconnecting people to our planet and as angie said look the key to this not just saving charismatic species yes if you do you'll save all the other species that are in the landscape with them but it's about the habitat it's about the landscapes and just to remind you if you ever do come to the mara serengeti just remember you are privileged to watch the most extraordinary wildlife event on earth and it is not there for our entertainment it is a spectacle yes it to our eyes but let's be reverential in our appreciation of it 
let's add, take away memories, but also say to ourselves that we have to do everything possible. One, not to disrupt events like this by not following the rules, but also to cherish nature. And so the latest book, Sacred Nature 2, out in August. And in that, we've broken it down into landscapes. And looking at each of the landscapes from savannas, where there is in the Mara over 3,000 elephants, and yet 3,000 elephants sounds a lot in a small area. But how does 15,000 elephants killed a year sound? Some people would say, you know, it wasn't so long ago, it was 30,000 a year. In the 1980s, 60,000 elephants were being killed a year and yet stand or drive out onto the African savannas. And in the presence of these unbelievable creatures, and you would want to literally get down on your hands and knees and say sorry for all the trauma that we have wrought. So the forest environments, the woodlands, the plants, remember 85% or 80% plus of biomass, of weight, of life on earth is plants, it's the green world. And yet, just like the savannas, they're under threat from this tidal wave of humanity. 4,000 tigers, if we're lucky, left in the world. 4,000. They've lost 95% of their natural landscape. Namibia, the deserts, they seem so remote, so harsh, and yet they're so important to us. What are we doing? We're going in and mining them, digging them up. They're like gold. We need to treasure them. And if you're ever flying to mountain scenery, the great Himalayas on your way from Kolkata to Bhutan, somewhere that Angie was told about by her parents when she was little, Kingdom of the Thunder Dragon. And again, these mountain areas where there is just a thousand mountain gorillas still, this huge creature, 400 pounds, dwarfed by the green landscape. We have to try to nurture it. And water, so precious. 2% of our water is fresh water. And our oceans, drowning in plastic, overfished. There is no such thing as sustainable fishing. And the polar regions, those great deserts, Antarctica and the Arctic. And so this is the cover picture from Sacred Nature Volume 1. And Sacred Nature 2 has a tiger on the front. And it is our pledge, it is our pledge. So there's, yes, and you just reminded me, Sacred Nature. That's the book, Volume 2, Reconnecting People to Our Planet. We've seen the third wet proofs. We're very excited, designed by our son, curated uh, the Kickstarter with uh, his fiance Tori, soon to be married. And, you know, time is running out. And when I say that, time's running out on our own personal clock. We're now in our 70s, or I am, Angie's, you know, you wouldn't believe it, but she's headed that way too. We've got so little time to make a difference, but we have to. You know, I was talking to Margie and, and you know, the generosity of our friends in helping us fund this book. People like Margie, Margie who have rallied around us. So much goodwill out there. And it's very hard not to feel despondent. When we think about migrations, you know, whether it's bird migrations, you know, at some point, it, we, a bird migration can seem so free and wonderful and, and, and sort of, you know, carefree, the sky. But at some point, those birds have to come to the ground. Will they be feeding on, you know, pesticide-riddled food? Will they be slaughtered in places like Malta? Are we going to kill all those, uh, you know, pigeons? Are we going to protect our birds of prey? Nowhere is sacred. And that's what we want to try to remind people. And sometimes people say sacred, but isn't that religious? Isn't that about God? No. Sacred is the one word that we believe is powerful enough to be applied to the wonder of nature and the importance of nature, because nature is the giver of life. You've heard it before. It's where our water comes from. It's the provider of food. It's not the fridge. It's not the tin can or the TV meal that you've got, you know, shrink wrapped. Where does it all come from? It comes from nature. And the beauty of nature is it's got so much to give to us. It's free. I believe that everybody has the means to actually 
find a little bit of nature as everybody as angie always says everybody's got a sacred nature might be somebody who's got a beloved potted plant and they watch it bloom each year in their kitchen it might be a lady who we watched a little old lady from germany who was on an antarctic trip with us and it was freezing and she was standing right out on the front of the deck and people were going down with blankets and saying, you know, please, you must be cold, bring you a hot chocolate. Trying to say to her, come in, you know, and she said, why? She said, I spend most of my life in a one bedroom apartment in Berlin. And I dream of coming to this place, a place beyond reality, to marvel at the wonder of the natural world. And so from Angie and myself, and a huge thank you to Margie, for inviting us to do this, to Rafaela, who I've probably driven her crazy because I sent her some notes about what I talk about, and I'm sure I've thrown in some stuff there that will have challenged her translation gifts, and to Guto, and to all of you for being so patient and listening, and I hope you're still there, and we look forward to answering some of your questions. Thank you so, so much, both of you. Uh, it's just marvellous to hear everything that you tell us about and that honestly brings tears to my eyes. Uh, as you say, the importance of this whole connection with nature and, and the concern that I like you, that I feel that where are we going? You know, How can we keep this going? Because if anything, these animals deserve a place and be able to live their lives as much as we do. So there are a few questions for you both. Uh, I'll go through some of them here. Um, regarding your soon-to-be-produced book, uh, yeah. Sylvia asks if you're going to have a version in Portuguese. Uh, do you know, we would love to have it in versions, you know, that everybody could read. I think the good thing is uh, at the present time, there aren't plans to do that. But uh, if anybody knows a Portuguese publisher or translator who would, uh, you know, be interested, we're hoping that when people see what we've tried to achieve through the book and through the Sacred Nature Initiative, that people who have the means to be able to reach out and take our idea and support it and give it the reach that we believe it deserves. Because quite frankly, uh, th there is no more important issue facing us today than the health of the environment. I don't care, you know, who we are, where we are, you know, what our status in life is. God help us if we don't get it at this point, uh, because because we have to. And any business, and, and I'm so pleased to see, you know, some of the big businesses now stepping up and understanding that actually protecting nature is good for business because if you don't, you are digging a hole that one day, even if you don't fall down it, your beloved ones who might inherit your business, they will certainly be left actually with the wreckage of trying to get themselves out of a quagmire, which could be avoided. There are ways of doing business of every kind which are still profitable, but which don't end up killing the golden goose. Oh, yeah, now, the lady, so the Portuguese, uh, the only good thing is, <laughs> sorry, well, I tell you the good news uh, to, to our friend in Portugal is my sister lives in Portugal. And so I don't know if that's just a random thought. I know Angie's thinking to herself, do they realize that you have ADD and that that has no relevance at all just because your sister's there, not unless she's going to publish it herself. But as I said, I'm hoping that the goodwill that's going to come the way of this effort and the, the sense of this is the right moment to be contributing. And, you know, when people say to us, how can we help? Well, we would love this book to be available in all languages. And we would love also to be able to ensure, whether it's a, a silly idea or not, because will, will people listen, that every president and every head of the Ministry of Tourism or Wildlife has a copy of the book. And the other good news for our friend in Portugal is, even if it doesn't get translated into Portugal, it'll be very picture driven. That was the idea. Angie said, you know, if you look at the book and you don't get the message, well, we done we've really failed. I can't wait to see the new one. Uh, here's a quick question. Uh, I think it'll be quick because I've got a couple more following. 
Uh, Roseline, south of Brazil, she's asking what time of the year is best to see the flamingos? Flamingos. Um, that's, that actually is a, is a very good question. But you know, it's a little bit like with the migration of wildebeest. Because it's driven by the availability of food, and because that actually is dependent on sunshine and water conditions, and you know, I, I don't know if you do know, but Lake Nakuru, which uh, in Kenya was the, where Roger Tory Peterson described the greatest bird spectacle on earth, he was looking at Lake Nakuru. There's virtually, there's very few flamingos there because the water level of all things in a very dry country has risen for various reasons and the uh, alkalinity has become less, um, it's become more dilute and things have changed. But you know, to be quite honest, any time, any time, although I would say probably dry season, better than wet season, just simply because um, in the drier conditions, the birds will tend to be more congregated, you know, because they will be all in the place where they think they can get most, you know, they're going to be more dispersed when the, there's more water. Thank you. A question for Angie, as this comes from João. He, he's asking, I think you more or less answered this, but it'd be nice to hear Angie uh, answering. If the if the photographs are planned or thought out beforehand, or if they just happen, or a bit of the both things? I think as a photographer, you're constantly imagining in your head the photographs that you want to take. So if you're sitting watching a little kingfisher, it might be doing nothing at the time, but you're constantly envisaging where it's going to fly, how it's going to fly, where it's going to come and, and rest again. So it's a little bit of both. You know, you're very opportunistic in whatever is there is capturing your imagination to try and, and capture the, the very mm. the best essence of that creature that you're taking a picture of. But I know that Jonathan and I talk a lot about how it is that we are constantly thinking of images in our, our mm. head. So it is the answer to that would be it's a little bit of both. Yeah. And I think I think yeah I think Margie just following up on that, uh, you know, wildlife photography rather like certainly wildlife photography in a very um, heavily visited area like the Mara Serengeti, particularly the Mara. Um, wildlife photography is by nature, you know, pretty opportunistic. Uh, you go out, you maybe plan which animal you want to focus on. Maybe there's a leopard with cubs, so you're going and following a particular story and you've identified a situation which will be very rich in potential photography because more socializing when uh, the cats have cubs. But rather like sports photography, wildlife photography, a lot of it is very reactive. You know, it's not like a still life situation or where you're doing a fashion shoot where you're in control of the characters. So because we're not in control of the characters, um, then a lot of it is reactive. But we certainly do. Um, one of the things we do do is we we try to push ourselves to take more landscapes, you know, to capture more the we, we, the some of Angie's pictures that I love are where the subject is a small detail within the landscape. You know, maybe a giraffe instead of being sort of 18, 7, 19 feet tall, uh, just looks like a little tiny, uh, very distinct silhouette on a, a huge cloudscape. But no, we're constantly, I think it's the one thing we say we believe is the biggest step up mentally in being a photographer is when you are thinking about the pictures that you want to take as opposed to what's in front of you. Yeah, I can really identify with that. And uh, that's one reason, in fact, why I'm living in Brasilia, because I don't know if you've passed through here on your trips to the Pantanal, but I love Brasilia because it, like the Mara, has a huge sky. Yes. And uh, I love Angie's pictures, like the one you mentioned, with a tiny little bit of a head of giraffe sticking out in the immensity yeah. of the plains and the sun yeah. and the clouds behind. Yeah. But uh, let's go on to the next one. Paolo Cesar asks if asks about the mortality rate, if it's mm. pretty high during the migration with the babies, particularly, or not. So, so you know, an interesting thing on that is, so 1.2 million wildebeest or thereabouts, 
Um, we have, they estimate half a million calves born. So obviously births must equal deaths in terms of keeping the population at that level. The main mortality factors, the biggest for mortality factors, uh, and rather like with lions, their population being um, driven by resident prey availability, that limits their numbers. For the wildebeest, it's the availability of grass. To, to some degree, water too, you know, they're water dependent, but it's if in bad years, in dry years, the mortality and of younger animals, uh, you know, is greater. And so, but one of the interesting things, and I didn't mention it, but this is a good point to do it. We've always been perplexed by the fact there is heavy poaching. So there's heavy killing using wire snares, very simple, you know, from old truck tires or from telephone wire or, you know, just wire that you can pick up making nooses of wire and attaching them to a tree. So you can't snare the wildebeest when they're on the open plains because there's nowhere to attach the, to, to, la to anchor the snare to. But when they move into the Western corridor where there's more acacia woodland, there was a time where people were saying that the poaching um, you know, was in the region of say 100,000 animals, 100,000 wildebeest. There are other animals obviously get killed too. But um, we've been expecting at some point for the meat poaching to have a significant impact on the actual population. But to date, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't done it. And, and we're a little surprised. I mean, either there isn't as many, the, the numbers aren't as, as uh, great as they were. But I think what we could and we must look out for is that with the way the migration used to be half the size or even 20,000, uh, 200,000, it used to just move between the short grass plains into the western part of the Serengeti. It didn't used to come as far north. This trend that we're seeing now of rather than half the migration coming to the Mara in the dry season, four months, and spending four months there, we're now looking at 150,000. So it's reduced to a quarter of what we were getting. And instead of spending the four months there in the dry season, they're spending less time. So the worry is with any of these populations that you could get a change. And another of the changes which could have a big impact is the seasonal drying up of the Mara River due to deforestation in the Mao, our largest indigenous forest, offtake for agriculture, potential offtake for dams or hydroelectric power, the river is becoming less, more, you know, sparser. So these events could precipitate at some point, you know, with these populations, you can suddenly reach a tipping point and it doesn't just gradually continue to reduce in terms of numbers gradually, but can suddenly crash. And, and so we need to be on the lookout because the loiter migration, that 120,000 crashed. Some people say there's only 10,000 there, 20,000. So huge decline. Oh, it's scary. Yeah. Uh, I'd like oh, to. Maggie, sorry, one last thing. Hmm. I, Angie and I have a great hero, and you will know his name uh, because he's a Brazilian and he's now got to be 80. Sebastião Salgado. What a what a what an extraordinary man, and uh, his wife I think is Leila. And my excuses and apologies to her if I, I I haven't got her name right, because an incredibly powerful lady, and influence within their life. But what I loved about he spent his time, you know, some of it, uh, following the migration of people off the land, driven off the land, land sold, nowhere to work, drifting to the cities, and went to places like Rwanda, saw the Holocaust uh, of killings there. And then, and, th and then, um, uh, sorry, I just lost my train there. Um, oh, yeah. And then he became so despondent, you know, with, with humanity and with what we were doing to our fellow man and to the landscape, 
that he eventually decided that he wanted to go back and connect with the planet. And he wanted to connect with people who were still living closely to the planet, such as people in the Brazilian forests, um, people in parts of Africa, people in the Itarai forest in the Congo. And he did this and he said, you know, as bad as things seem to be, he said he found hope in seeing that we are, can still, if we're listening, find lessons from those people still living quietly, sustainably, some of who left the cities and have gone back to those environments, and who find that actually in nature, as long as you've got sufficient food and, and you know, you can live at peace and live in harmony. And, and just a wonderful influence. That book was called Genesis, uh, his latest book. And of course, he replanted and reforested his family's uh, farm and created this seedling bank. So, you know, he's, he's done it all. He's, he's enlightened our world with his wonderful imagery. He's, you know, an icon and somebody who seems to be true to himself. He's not out there taking pictures for self-aggrandizement. He's got a message and he's giving back. So, hallelujah. Jonathan, it's, it's amazing for me anyway, I first started following him when he was actually doing stuff in Africa, especially like up yes. in Ethiopia and, and stuff like that. So uh, let me just go on quickly with these questions. Uh, I'm going to join two together because they kind of touch on the same thing. Hoserni asks, uh, do you think that uh, ecotourism is a solution? Uh, to, for preservation. And then in the same vein, Gerard asks, uh, since you mentioned the migration, mm. to what extent does the presence of tourists, observers, hinder or even alter the process? Well, I think, you know, we've learned a, a salutary lesson with COVID because the bottom has fallen out of tourism in Kenya. Uh, and tourism, as in most African countries and most areas of the most biodiversity, are in areas which often economically are to a degree, uh, you know, not as rosy as in some parts of the world. And we, uh, for instance, South Africa, I think only 25% of revenue for, tour for conservation comes from national government. The rest is from tourism and NGOs. Well, we have to find a more sustainable model than tourism, but tourism is hugely important when it is there. As to the negativity of tourism, we certainly at times do not get the balance right here. Uh, there's greed, there, there's, there's, you know, which sacrifices the benefit of the, the health of the environment for the sake of the profit. And they, and I mean, to give you a very uh, easy example, Femke Brockhaus, who was studying cheetahs for uh, a project we're patron of, the Mara Predator Conservation Program, uh, she uh, assessed the cheetah population in the Mara, came up with new figures, um, and was able to show that in areas of higher tourism, cheetah mothers raise less cubs. When you extracted any kind of skewing of the results due to, well, were there more lions, were there more leopards, was it hyenas, what other effects? No, just purely on analyzing the data. And the fact is sometimes people follow a mother cheetah when she's trying to hunt. Sometimes people get too close to a mother cheetah at a den when she's trying to hide her cubs, when she's very vulnerable. And if she's trying to then move them, they wanna get the photograph and get in front of her. So we have to stop looking at these opportunities to see the wonders of the world and view them as entertainment at the cost of the players, the wildlife. Don't you think, love? Definitely. We won't Sorry. Yeah, no, I know, Angie. I, I mean, we'll give you an example. As much as we've loved going and seeing the river crossings, I, I very much doubt right now whether we could stomach a big river crossing uh, because it's uh, it, it's actually you feel ashamed, and I know the authorities want to 
tackle the pro project, the, the problem. Unfortunately, you know, we had prior to COVID so many camps and lodges, you know, it, in the areas surrounding the reserve on private land in what are called the wildlife conservancies, there's a more sustainable model. One bed, one tourism bed per 700 acres. So a much more thought out, animal friendly form of tourism, less vehicles, better behavior, less people, less camps and lodges. We, you know, if we're serious, that's what we need. That I'd like to ask you a kind of difficult question that's very pertinent to Brazil. And Gerard has written it here. What are your, I mean, I know you've been photographing jaguars in the Pantanal yeah. to, um, on a few occasions, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And what are your thoughts? Were you particularly shocked to see the way that jaguars are hounded by the boats on the river and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't I don't think that I was shocked, rather like I wasn't shocked when the marshlands were poisoned, because there, you know, you've got various scenarios which is sort of like a train wreck waiting to happen. And based on human nature and the tourism models that are applied, you, you get this wonderful scene, which is featured in our book. We've got some beautiful Jaguar pictures and Pantanal pictures in Sacred Nature, volume two. Um, but you know inevitably that if there isn't a very strict regulation and a, and a management plan and a well thought out management plan which says we these animals are beginning to show pressure when there's 10 boats so therefore no more than 10 boats let's reduce it to eight but if, the trouble is if you lose control by allowing too many camps and lodges now you're up a gum tree. So for instance, in the Mara, if you've got too many camps and lodges inside the reserve, and this is a key point, and this is where India was very smart, no camps and lodges inside most of their protected areas. You have to queue up at the gate. They can then regulate the number of cars that come in. But if you've got camps and lodges in the protected area and you have allowed too many camps and lodges, well, now you're gonna be sucking your thumb. How are you going? Now you're going to be forced to keep people from off-road driving. You're going to have to be much more authoritarian in your approach. And you're going to have to somehow try to prevent it turn turning into a circus. So no, I'm not surprised to see more boats. Everybody wants to see, the, you know, the Jaguars. And then, of course, you get caught up with the next conundrum, which is, well, okay, are you going to be like Botswana and are you going to make your tourism model low density but costing much more? So you pay more, but there's less of you. So you make the same amount of money as having 10 people there as you would if you had one because you're going to pay $100 in total, whichever way it was. So now you do that. Now people are going to say that you're being elitist. I can't afford $1,000 to go $5,000 to stay at Mombo in Botswana, however wonderful it is. Well, E.O. Wilson, who Gerard will know, you'll probably know their name too, Margie, the Professor E.O. Wilson, you know, the David Attenborough of science and zoology. He said, rather wishfully thinking, but you know, good on him, wrote a book called Half Earth. We've still got time to put half the planet, you know, protect it for nature. Well, I, I, we, we know from David Attenborough's latest thing, Wilderness is now at 35% of what it was, so where are we going? But he made a good point, which is there are going to have to be some areas which have to be sacrosanct, which we just have to feel good to know they're there, but which we're told, no, I'm sorry, that's a restricted area, and that really is for nature. And, you know, you're going to have to have maybe more webcams, more remote devices, which will allow people to see the great migration without such a heavy footprint. But you will have to find a way, if you do that, if you have less people, you've got to somehow, somebody's got to pay the bill. Now, right now, George Schaller, the wonderful zoologist who we all would have loved his career, Dr. George Schaller, uh, he was called, he, you know, he said, well, you know, we've got to do more. 
And the interviewer said, yeah, but who's going to pay? How are we going to pay for it? And, and I mean, he, I, I think, and this is me saying, and I'm sure he didn't, he's way too polite, but you could almost hear the snort of indignation when he said, and this is a few years ago, America's defense bill for a week in Iraq is more than the annual money set aside to protect the environment. Well, where, what, what happened here? Yeah? aren't they I mean, how much we even spend sending rovers to the moon instead of land rovers to the mara you know yeah. it, it's mind-boggling uh anyway i'll move on because we could carry on talking about this forever uh, paddy cunningham from london says you said the survival of the serengeti mara is due to the maasai people yeah. but east african countries routinely exclude them from national parks. How can you explain that? Okay, so, you know, everything has a context, don't we? We can talk about the first people and the indigenous people and whatever, but the Maasai came from the Nile region in the 15th century, and they've probably been in the Mara region, I think people will say a couple of hundred years. There were cattle people a thousand years ago, not Maasai, but other cattle people, and uh, signs of their, you know, as I say, savannas of our birth. People were part of the savannah ecosystem. We helped to actually create them. So when we say that the Maasai are excluded from parts of what was traditionally their land, even though we have to remember the Maasai traditionally did not have a can concept of land ownership. They basically just roamed with their cattle and they had their warriors and, you know, they basically could push the agriculturists around and pretty much go where they wanted to. But in more recent times, the government has wanted the Maasai to become Kenyans or Tanzanians. And in Tanzania, not to, to wear red robes, but to wear trousers and, and to, to become part of the cash economy. Part of the Mara Serengeti, so half of the Mara Serengeti, 25,000 square kilometers, is protected and the Maasai are not allowed to come inside it with their cattle, even though they do. Now there is a part of the protected area, the Ngorongora conservation area, where the Maasai were going to be allowed to continue their traditional form of land use, but not to actually develop agriculture. But in time, the Maasai have changed from the milk and blood and everything that was, you know, would be sold to us on the idea of, you know, nutrition, which of course was only part of the story. But the Maasai, you know, like other uh, people in Kenya and East Africa, the primary, you know, uh, carbohydrate will be maize meal. And so now they become beholden to the farmers and they either then illegally will start to farm or they have to pay a very heavy price for it. So half of the area is denied to them but in a place like the Masai Mara, the Masai Mara is a national reserve which is run by the Maasai of Narok County in which it falls. All of the employees are Maasai. And so, and 19% of the revenue from the reserve is meant to go back to projects such as schools and medical facilities for the Maasai. And then the other half of the ecosystem, certainly part of it, the Mara, if we just talk about the Mara, not the Serengeti for a minute, we talk about the greater Mara, 6,000 square kilometers. 1,500 of it, a quarter of it is the reserve, three quarters of it is private land. And quite a lot of that has been, even though it's been subdivided, the people have chosen to put their land into a pot called a wildlife conservancy, maybe 700 landowners with 100 uh, acres, you know, 150 to 150 acres plots. And they have made a deal with tourism operators, the tourist industry, to create a wildlife conservancy, and they are paid a monthly lease fee for their land. And then there's a restricted number of people allowed to enter it, have camps and lodges. The problem, so they, they are still in charge of their own destiny on that side of it. But the problem, of course, now where we've, this has gone a bit beyond the question, but the problem now is 
that form of wildlife conservancy dependent on tourism and a guaranteed payment per month for an for the lease the tourist operators and the Maasai have had to renegotiate on a 50% discount. Well, how long can that last? Fortunately, the Kenya government and NGOs are sort of helping to fill the coffers. But as Richard Leakey tried to do many, many years ago, he said, we need a safety net. We need a couple of hundred, and this would now have to be a lot more, a couple of hundred million dollars uh, it might have been $2 million, but anyway, let's say it was, for the sake of it, $200 million in a bank account and the interest there available for when situations like COVID happen to bankroll our protected areas. Otherwise, we're stuffed. Anyway, back to the Maasai. Yes, their, their, their lifestyle and their way of life is changing. Land use is changing. Non-Maasai are buying their land. They still have a foothold, a big foothold in the area, and it's challenging for them to try to ensure that wildlife creates a revenue for them so as they still feel that it's worth protecting. Okay, Jonathan, thank you so much. I think we have to start winding up now because oh. uh, we, we would like to ask you questions all day. Okay. Uh, I can't thank you enough for this wonderful presentation. It's very moving, particularly since, as you know, half of my heart is in Kenya as well with you. Mm. and. I think everybody's been fascinated. Uh, Brazil's a huge country and Africa seems a long way away, but the migration is you know, recognized worldwide as something very special. And I'm sure a lot of people will be absolutely fascinated to see how it goes on to, in, in you know, details that we don't think about until you explain it with the zebras and then the gnu and then the gazelles mm -hmm. following along behind and all Angie's wonderful photographs. So, uh, miss you, and just want to say thank you so, so much for joining us on Avistar today. It's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, all the questions that have been unanswered, I'll have to send them to you on an email. <laughs> you can do that. And thank you. Know, you. And Maggie, the, the irony is we should have been in the Pantanal. When were we due to go? Last mm, year? Yeah. Last yeah, we September. were meant to be there. Uh, yeah, we would have been... Uh, yeah in there with a great friend uh, back in the Pantanal. But believe me, we'll, we'll get there one day. Yeah, we'll, we'll be back. And, and in, the, in the meantime, thank goodness for photography and the ability to share the wonders of the natural world, even when we can't actually be there in person. So love to Ninian and everybody and all the, uh, love to you all, you know. <laughs> and, and especially to Raffaele and to good old Guto, who must have been having a heart attack. <laughs> So now you can turn to the end. He's, he's used to that. So, Good. Thanks, so shall, we, shall we click the button? I don't. Guto will probably just oh, switch. No, yeah, Guto will yeah, just, yeah, sure he'll, just, he'll pull the plug. Yeah, he will. So, good evening for you and a good yeah. rest after this last hour and a half we've been at it. Thanks so much. Yeah. And see you again soon and see you in Brazil as soon as you're allowed to come. Lovely. Bye. Thanks so much. It's Bye. a pleasure.